Hello, everybody. This is the Neapolitan Room. We're going to be seeing uh, Java Snoop, how to hack anything written in Java. And I'm going to introduce your introducer, Sammy Kampgar. Thank you. <laughs> it's my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce the man who needs an introducer. <laughs> to introduce the name. <laughs> My previously foe, now my friend, Arshan Devirsiagi on Thank Java Snoop. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really, I wanted something. Is this, can you hear me? I wanted an introduction that would be more awkward than my talk. So that's why we, that's why we did that. So this, this, will, this will go smoothly compared to that. Um, so we're releasing a tool today. Actually, we released it a few days ago called Java Snoop. Um, the, the whole point of Java Snoop is to make theoretical vulnerabilities turn into actual vulnerabilities. So if you're looking at this, this diagram here, oh, uh, sorry, I'm Arsh Anabirisiagi. I work for Aspect Security, Director of Research. There you go. Um, let's talk about Java Snoop. So here's a dumbed down version of any architecture diagram of any application you've seen ever, right? So a typical three-tiered thing. So the client is labeled client, and theoretically, any more information about the client is irrelevant because you know that the client controls their own machine. Therefore, they can have their client do anything. But actually, in practice, that's a lot more difficult. And especially if you're a consultant or you ever do time-boxed engagements, uh, if you're basically working for real in the security world, you don't have a lot of time to turn the theoretical into the practical. And theoretical vulns don't really get fixed at the same rate that uh, demonstrated phones do. So, client is a client. So we're going to talk about why hacking Java applications, because Java is just Java is just an example here, right? So, uh, Silverlight, .NET, Flash, whatever, all these are perfectly good, thick client-side technologies uh, that don't have great tools for, you know, turning those practical uh, or turning those theoretical vulnerabilities into real vulnerabilities. So I did it with Java, but I really want somebody to make one in Flash so I can, you know, win all those Facebook games. Uh, but that was a lot harder than doing it in Java. So let's talk about why it's actually difficult. Because, you know, in in practice or in theory, Java is a very malleable language. You know, it's supposed to be deterministic to compile and decompile. Um, all the data objects are are well known. The structure there's a spec out there. Uh, so everything kind of seems clean from outside, but really it's not so clean. So we're going to go through a week in the life of a security consultant where they have an engagement where they have to review a thick Java client. And this is really kind of where Java Snoop came from. So start the 24 theme music. So security company X could be any security company. You know, we want you to test this important applet. Right, so an, an applet is, uh, you, you know, can be thought of the same way as a Java desktop app or a Java web start application. It's all just Java, right? And so people are very aggressive in the consulting world about getting your business. So they'll bid on a job without really knowing how to do the job. Um, so of course you can't, you know, you can't learn the Java framework in one week, and also you can't use any tools on thick job applications. Uh, so you can't scan them, you can't whatever them. So it's all about digging. So here's our applet, our target applet. And again, we got 40 hours to do it. We have zero intel on the app. It looks like some kind of chat thing. We probably have no idea uh, what the traffic looks like. You know, that's not going to be too hard to find out what it looks like. But you know, initially, we have no documentation. And one of the things you learn after being a security consultant for a while is the documentation often is totally wrong or leads you down very wrong paths. So after you know, bitching about not having that, that useful intel, you're already you know, behind the eight ball. So the way I see it, you have three options for trying to hack a thick client. The first option is what everybody immediately goes for, and that's to hack the traffic between the client and the server. You see, we have these great tools for proxying browser traffic. Right? We have Web Scarab and Fiddler, Burp, and all these tools that have been pretty much commoditized. We commoditize that problem. Uh, but 
when we have a thick Java application, it's not always that clean, right? It may not be, uh, you know, they may not have HTTP at all. And even if they do, they may not have configurable proxy settings. So even if it does use HTTP, you can't, you know, you know, get yourself into the middle of it without doing some crazy stuff. Um, and on top of that, the traffic might be obfuscated in some way that, although it's theoretically possible for you to alter, in practice it isn't. So for instance, if they're using serialized, encrypt or serialized objects, you know, it's possible that you could write a tool, like somebody wrote a burp plugin that would allow you to you know, edit a serialized object across the wire. Um, but in general, it's kind of hard. So if they use encryption, like their own kind of encryption, on top of that, it's going to be hard to, to proxy and alter that traffic um, in a way that would be useful. Um, and if they use custom protocols. So if, if they have a custom protocol and you only have 40 hours to review it, by the time you're done reversing the protocol to figure out how to actually make meaningful tests, you're going to be out of time. So we can't let it get that far. So this, this option just doesn't work on its own. So for this particular applet uh, that I'm looking at, I wireshark the traffic. Uh, looked like it was going over HTTP, which was great. But then I discovered it wasn't actually HTTP. It was some uh, goddamn weird new bizarro protocol they invented. So again, more time just down the drain. So uh, this, is the, this is the second option. This is what Stephen DeRise, I think, just talked about in the other talk. Um, I didn't get to see it, but uh, he probably told you something like this. Uh, there's this idea that you can grab the classes, grab the code base of the applet or the desktop application, whatever, decompile it, then alter it to be malicious, and then recompile it and run it. This is a good idea in theory. All right, these are our theoretical next steps. Um, but what happens in reality? Code doesn't even compile. Uh, you know, your tests are either completely invalid because just the integrity of the application is shot because the decompila decompilation process is not deterministic, um, or they're just never happened because it was too complex, too complex to actually recompile. So that's our option number two. Our option number one, hack the traffic. Option number two, hack the client. So here's what happens when I tried option number two. Just grab the applet code base. And again, it's a binary, right? It's just a jar file you download. So it's a compiled binary. All references should be resolved and all that kind of stuff. But actually, when you decompile it, I ended up with 3,800 errors. So we don't have the kind of time to fix 3,800 compilation errors before, you know, and insert error malicious, malicious attacks and expect to get meaningful tests um, in one week. And time just keeps ticking. So option number three, the, the limitations are similar to option number one. The protocol might not be something you're familiar with. Um, it might be expecting serialized objects or uh, some new protocol that you don't understand. Um, so the idea that you can go directly to the server you know, bypass the client entirely. In some cases, this might work. In fact, in some cases, all of these might work. But I'm saying the, in the majority of them, they won't. And it takes too long anyway to be realistic. So again, the, the serialized object, the, the encryption, uh, and custom protocols, all that stuff just, just makes that really, really difficult to do practically. So we tried to talk to the server. Again, it was some new raw byte protocol that I'd never seen before. Uh, you know, the app was, applet was written you know, probably five years ago. So something I just didn't understand at all. And I wasn't going to, you know, try to understand it because it wasn't going to do any good. By the time I was done understanding it, the, the time box was going to be closed. So in my life, whenever I have a serious problem, I always look to Anna Ferris for inspiration. Anna Ferris, a Baltimore native like me, she's my, she's my muse. So. I said, what would Anna Ferris do? And she said, well, what if you had Burp you know, or Web Scarab, but used it to intercept method calls within the JVM? So what if, what if you could set up a breakpoint in the Java process, essentially, where, and, and not like Ali debug level interception. I'm talking about you know, something like all of us can understand. So something where when that method gets hit, you could alter the parameters 
or maybe you could alter the return value on the way out. That kind of thing would be useful to us because then if we're inside the JVM, we can set a breakpoint somewhere where we understand what's happening before maybe our data gets onto the network. Right? So I can edit a person object if I have the right interface, but the serialized object, you know, version that's going across the wire, I really don't understand what's happening there. So Anna is surprisingly technical <laughs> on top of all her other admirable traits. So this, uh, this idea that we could intercept method calls sounds a lot like instrumentation to me. So instrumentation has been something that's been used a lot in the lower, le lower levels of security, uh, reverse engineering and all kinds of cool stuff. But we haven't seen much instrumentation at the application layer. So that has to change because instrumentation is just too powerful. I say instrumentation is like having a rich white uncle. It opens a lot of doors. So you still got to step through those doors. You still got to go to the job interview, right? But they, they get you places. So what is instrumentation if you're not familiar? Instrumentation is all about wedging new code into a binary. Right? That could be uh, you know, a binary after it's been compiled but before it's been run. Or after it's running, you could change it at runtime. So this is an example of using instrumentation to put in a couple logging calls in the do something method. So this is a silly little method, just does a hash, and it returns the result. So, so that's, that's it at a high level, but act, to actually do it, you need to get a little bit lower in the stack. Um, so what will we do with instrumentation? Maybe we should answer that question first. So here's what I'm going to do with instrumentation. I'm going to wedge in a call at the beginning of the method that makes a synchronized call out of the current process and into my process and gives me an opportunity to edit that data. And then I'll do the same thing with the return value. Okay, so all we have to do is pick a method, wedge these pieces of, of code in there, and then watch for those calls in our other evil process. So at the end of the day, what I want is this. I want some evil program like you see on the right, Java Snoop, um, and then we've got our, our you know, applet on the left that we're attacking. So when our method gets hit, the method that we're interested in, it'll send the parameters over to the other application, to the evil application. We'll edit them there, and then we'll send back the tampered result. Okay, so the good data is in the original application, sends it to the evil Java Snoop program. Java Snoop sends back the tampered results, and the applet is never the wiser. All right, so same thing for the return value. All right, so instrumentation is not an easy uh, subject. Um, and it took a lot to, uh, to understand what was happening, to understand how to use it, and to do what I wanted to do. But it took a lot of time. Right? And time is like the one thing we really don't have in, in a typical assessment. So to actually redefine a class in Java to put in our calls, we need to actually work with the bytecode. Right? I tried putting in alert document. I'll kill you. That, that didn't do anything. <laughs> Turns out that's not valid Java bytecode. So clearly, we needed to work a little bit harder. So there's a tool by uh, Sammy Koivu. I'm probably butchering your name, sorry. It's called ReJava. And it shows you bytecode of existing class files. Or, yeah. So um, here's an example of a method that I used ReJava to wedge in the uh, bytecode for a simple system out print line. So I just put in some print statements at the beginning and end of a function. So writing position independent bytecode in Java is actually ridiculously easy. It, it sounds like something might be hard, but it's really, really easy. Um, so with that, you know, no, having that knowledge, it wasn't too difficult then to, to turn those system out print line calls into synchronized callouts. So uh, if you're if you're a Linux person and you're a typical daily Dave reader, 